Hi, I'm Park Howell, and welcome to The Business of Story, where purpose-driven people like you learn how to craft and tell compelling stories to grow your revenue and amplify your impact. If you would like to clarify your story in under 30 minutes, visit me at businessofstory.com because you got to own your story to grow your brand. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. I'm not kidding, but I actually asked today's guest if I needed to get permission from his parents to have him on the show. Hi, and welcome to another unique edition of Business's Story. You are about to hear from 16-year-old Jesse Kay, a precocious New Jersey high school student who is wise beyond his years. I mean, frighteningly so. Jesse hosts a popular and growing podcast called 20 Under 20 to help ignite the entrepreneurial spirit in his fellow Gen Zers. The Huffington Post called 20 Under 20 a podcast interviewing successful young entrepreneurs across the globe, distilling practical lessons and stories from the brightest millennial men and women paving the way for his generation. That's pretty good to have a show in high school that hits the Huffington Post. Now, All the rage has been lately talking to and connecting with millennials. And right when you think you've got them figured out, here come the Gen Zers. They're younger brothers and sisters. And according to Jesse, they're ready to make their impact on their own terms. On today's show, Mr. K shares his insights on how to use storytelling to attract and retain Gen Zers to your brand. He explains what makes this young and hip population unique and diverse. There are no bad boundaries approach to living. He also covers how to communicate with the smartphone tablet generation, their preferred channels of storytelling and how to use them, and the importance of co-creating your stories with this dynamic demo through video, Instagram, and Snapchat. Are you ready? Because Gen Z Storytelling School is now in session with Jesse Kay. Hey, Jesse, welcome to the show, man. Thanks so much. I'm super excited to be here and get right into it. Now, you are the first guest I've had in almost 100 guests here on Business of Story where I reached out to you and I said, how's your day been going? And you said, great, just got home from high school. (laughs) I'm sure that's not a typical thing you have, but uh, (laughs) it's quite the story. (laughs) Well, you are doing quite a lot as a senior in high school. Now, where where are you? You're in New Jersey somewhere. Tell us about your town. Tell us about your high school. Tell us about the thing that you rocked this week in class. All right. So I'm actually a junior in high school, so oh, one year younger than that. Um, but I'm from a pretty small town in New Jersey, in northeastern New Jersey. I'm about 45 minutes to an hour and a half outside New York City, depending on traffic. Um Probably 8,000 people in my town, one store, pretty much the mid, not the middle of nowhere, but it's not heavily populated. Um, very close knit community. And it's a regional high school with four surrounding towns. And, you know, it's just the high school is very competitive. It's very good. So that's sort of been my focus the last week, along with the podcast and networking and all that kind of stuff. Finals are coming up. So it's sort of just been a grind in multiple senses. So you've got this podcast, 20 Under 20s. Tell us a little bit about what it's about and what was the impetus for it. So I'll, I guess I'll start at the beginning. I think that's probably the best way to go uh, uh, about it. Yep, you bet. So the idea behind it came, I'm a junior right now, like I said, and I'm in an entrepreneurship class, which is awesome that my school has it. But at the beginning of the year, we had to come up with a product or service and write a business plan for it. And I realized a ton of kids in my class had great ideas and they were super creative, but they had no idea where to start. 
So I did more research on that and I realized a lot of kids are very interested in business, entrepreneurship, finance, anything like that. And they're very bright, but they don't know where to execute what a first step should be. So because of that, I created my podcast, 20 Under 20s, where I interview some of the most successful young entrepreneurs in their 20s or below so they could connect with a youth audience and talk about their experiences, lessons, and stories from creating and running their own business, the balance between work and school, and all of that good stuff with the goal of inspiring and educating the next generation of future entrepreneurs. And who are some of the people, the luminaries uh, in the teen world that you had on your show? You'd be surprised how many incredible entrepreneurs um, there are that are under 20, um, even under 30, but so many under 20. Um, some of the people I've had are people who've been on Shark Tank and gotten deals. Ben Cern of Nobo, he got a deal with Mark Cuban. I've had people who run venture capital firms at 19, people who run youth marketing agencies. Connor Blakely, he runs a youth marketing agency. Some of his clients are Sprint, um, Pepsi, awesome companies, and just tons of those incredible people who either launched a company, an app, and are doing insanely successful all at such a young age. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, Jesse, so you were in this entrepreneurial class and you saw these wonderful ideas. And I know exactly what you're talking about. Our son um, was in a, a class in high school and I noticed and I would go in and do some mentoring. And some of the ideas that would develop in the juniors and seniors in high school are really quite amazing. So you wanted to help them get some input. Now, were you an entrepreneur yourself or was it that, hey, wait, what I could do is give voice to all these other entrepreneurs, bring them on and teach my fellow classmates what they need to be doing next? So I would say it was a combination of both. Um, ever since a young age, I was lucky enough to have my dad be an entrepreneur. So that really had a huge impact on me growing up. Um, I got to see the hard work you put into becoming an entrepreneur and the reward of it paying off. Um, so that definitely had a big impact on me. And also, ever since I was nine years old, um, starting at nine, I flipped shoes on eBay. So I'd buy them at retail online or at a shoe store. And then I'd put a page right up on eBay and try and flip them and make, I don't know, 50 bucks per shoe. Um, so that was just a fun thing to do through middle school. And I made a couple thousand dollars, which wasn't that much, but it seemed like a ton for a, high, for a middle school. So it was awesome. Now, wait a sec. How do you buy shoes at retail that put them online and mark them up so people are obviously paying more for them and yet you're still able to move them? What'd you do there? So I went for limited edition shoes like high um, high demand Nikes, Jordans, those kind of shoes where they would sell out in like a minute. Uh -huh. And I would do a combination of stuff. I'd literally have my brother on one computer, me on a computer, my sister, the whole family on a computer for me. <laughs> And I'd even try to do some bots kind of stuff. And you just got to have quick fingers, I guess. And you got to uh -huh. make sure that you can. It's somewhat luck, too. But if I was lucky enough, let's say, to get a shoe for $200, once that sells out, that shoe may be worth $400. So wow. if you can get that and immediately put it up, that's an easy 200 bucks, And you, all you have to do is ship it. So you're playing the scarcity game, but you were literally buying them online. So you had to get there before somebody else, you and your brother and sister, buy them, and then turn around and put them on your own platform. Yeah, the whole process from trying to get them myself to selling them was probably three hours. And how did you come up with that idea? I was very interested in sneakers, um, and I had such an interest, and I loved all these new releases, cool shoes. So I was like, hey, all these other people love them too. Why don't I try and get them, see if I can flip them, and that'll just give me more money to get more shoes. Yeah, you must have made your father quite proud. Uh, he was pretty happy. He's like, I like the initiative you're taking. <laughs> All right. So um, fast forward then to today, you've got this podcast going. You've had a chance to talk to some really great uh, entrepreneurs. What is the the theme or the themes that you hear in all of these young entrepreneurs you have on your program that seem like really resonates with other people that are looking in, regardless of age, actually, of what to do to build a business? I think the number one thing is that they all say, just go out and start now. Don't wait. Um, the stars are never going to perfectly align to go out and start. Everyone's waiting for that perfect time, but that's never going to happen ideally. Um, so I would say that they say, go out, start your thing. And if it fails, hey, failure's learning. So go out, try and do something and make it happen right now. And what out of all of your guests, you've had, what, a 10, 12 guests or so? I'm, I'm on your site right now. Yeah. So 20under20s.com. Uh, yep. 
So I've recorded probably 30 to 35 at this point. Um, mm -hmm. And 10 are, 10 are live now. Um, it's just difficult because I'm controlling the getting the guests, recording, interviewing, editing, and all of that. So I'm just trying to... It's difficult to get my editing. I'm not the best editor in the world. So I struggled with that. I tried to do my first episode, and it probably took three hours. So... Mm -hmm. Um, that's the only thing that's holding me back, but I'm, I think I'm trying to just produce great content for my listeners. And how do you go about getting your guests? This is actually a story I love to tell. Um, now it's much easier. Um, but back at the beginning, I got connected with one person. His name's Connor Blakely. I mentioned him. He runs the youth marketing agency and he was my first guest. And I asked him, what's your advice on how to gain more followers? He's like, cold email, cold email, cold email. So for the first two months of my podcast, I sent out 350 cold emails every day. And just to various guests, just to people you wanted on? Yep. Anyone who inspired me, I pulled up the Forbes 30 under 30 list and found categories that interested me and found every single person's email that I could or came up with email. So, like, you know, you wouldn't find a certain person's email because it's not public, but let's say it's Jack Dorsey from Twitter. I just tried Jack at twitter.com, Jack D at twitter.com. It was just like a contest to see. <laughs> who I could get. And I was shocked. I thought, you know, nobody's going to respond. I'm a 16 year old kid has one episode recorded. Who's going to respond? And then I started getting responses from Mark Cuban, Bill Gates's uh, assistant, um, Jeff Bezos assistant, all of these insane people. And I was like, why are they responding to me? Clearly my cold email is working. And the fact that I'm 16, I think that probably played a part in it. So I wouldn't say it's all my cold emailing skills. It's probably the fact that I was 16 as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but now, wait a minute. They're not under 20. Are you trying to get them on your show? Yes and no. Okay. Number one, um, anyone in their 20s or below is my key audience. However, at that point, I knew I needed to have some high profile, po high profile people on to try and drive traffic there. And I think anyone, the whole goal is to have them connect with somebody. And mm -hmm. I think if somebody like a Mark Cuban could connect with that youth audience um, and people know him from Shark Tank and that kind of stuff. So I think long term, I may have a few rare ones where it's this was something recommended last week where somebody has said you could do it where you have them as like a mentor episode with a 40 year old mm -hmm. successful entrepreneur. So that's why I emailed some of those people, too. And it was also just a good way to test my cold emails out. But a majority of the people I emailed were Forbes 30 under 30, Crane 20 under 20. And that's how I got my first probably 10 interviews along with joining a group called the Next Gen Summit. It's changed my life. Um, it's a Facebook group and it's full of amazing young entrepreneurs. That's where I got my first couple interviews and I'm super excited. There's The summit is actually coming up in a few weeks and I'm really looking forward to that in New York City. The, North, the Next Gen Summit. Yep, I think their website is ngsummit.com, but that group has 100% changed my life. And how so? What have they done to have such an impact? Number one, their support, um, and everyone wants to give um, before they get. So for every time you'll ask for something, you'll give 10 times pretty much, and it's a group of 2,000 people who feel just that way. So that first day, I put a post out, and I have one recorded thing. Like, I was nothing, just like I had said, and I put out a post, here's my idea, and within 30 minutes, I had 50 people offering to be on the show. Mm -hmm. So... And they helped me network. They made their network my network and they supported me, pushed my episodes out, shared them, and they had a huge impact on my life. And I'm forever grateful to them. That's awesome. So your goal is to help your fellow students, these Gen Zers, and the Gen Zer is defined as what? Gen Z is defined as anyone born roughly between 1995 and 2014. So roughly anyone under 20, a little over. Okay. And what do you think makes this group different than your Gen Ys and your Gen Xs and Millennials, how that all comes together? What is what is special, different, unique about the Gen Z population? As Connor Blakely likes to say, I fall back on him sometimes because he is the Gen Z expert, as I like to call him. But he says that Gen Z is the most unique um, and diverse generation that the world has ever seen and nobody knows how to deal with them because they've never experienced something like us. Um, I would say that... If you look at Gen Z, um, it's we're, we grew up in a social media age and we grew up in a tech age. While with millennials, they started with, you know, your normal rotary phones or whatever, and it built up to being able to use tech. 
<laughs> while we well, did you did you just say start with your your rotary phone? I'm not even sure uh, they started with a rotary uh, phone. They Come started on, with they all a had base. Cells. They started with a flip phone. How about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Their phones had hinges on them. Uh, I'm too don't. young. I'm too okay. young. I just assume yeah. anyone before me was a rotary phone. No, I'm a rotary phone guy. Your Gen Ys and Gen Xers, they're your flip phone. Got a hinge on my phone, people. Okay, now we're now we're. I just <laughs> had to set the record straight there. Yeah. Um. So. <laughs> I would say that they started with flip phones, progressed, saw social media progress up to something like an iPhone. For Gen Z, most of us, we were born into that generation with smartphones, tablets. I mean, you look at every baby or five-year-old and they're playing on an iPad yeah. at dinner. I mean, they're grown up in that way. So I think brands have to be able to connect better with us by knowing how to utilize that technology, utilize social media, because I think that's the only way, and through influencers, I think that's the only way that... Um, big brands can uh, connect with our generation. I think that's why we're unique and diverse. Okay, Jess, let's let's uh, explore that a little bit. What makes you the most unique and diverse generation? Because uh, I think about any generation could say that. So I would say, yes, any generation is obviously unique and diverse. Um, but I think just the fact of, I sometimes fall back on technology. Um, I don't know if that's a good enough answer, but I think technology makes it diverse because you can connect that we're the first generation where um you can t um phone call order a pizza facetime your friends and call and text your mom all at the same time mm -hmm. so that's the only generation where you can interact with anyone so the uniqueness is i could talk to somebody in china right now if i wanted it's not there's no barrier so mm -hmm. i think that's the key part in making us unique that like i said we've grown up in this age where we can connect with anyone we want there's no barriers anyone can go out and start anything so what i think is you have to try and target to that sense of sort of being radical being able to be like far left far right anything you have to take a hard stance because i think that's what catches someone's attention because why would they the average time you spend on a facebook message or whatever is like five seconds you have to do something extreme to capture them you have to be extreme in your storytelling to capture the Gen Zers. Now, I totally get that. Do you, Jesse, use email? I do. Um, do you like it? Do you, is it? Because uh, I am always trying to figure out. I've got three kids, and ours are you know twenty three, twenty eight, and thirty four now. So they kind of are their own sort of separate generations, and they communicate in different ways with us. And our youngest won't use email hardly at all. So. Um, how do you guys all prefer to talk to mom and dad? Is this through text, telephone calls, or what? Okay, so I would break it down into three categories. Um, family slash friends, um, school and work, and then everything else. I would say that with family and friends, it's over text and social media. So whether that's Snapchat, whether that's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, iMessage, all of that, I think that's exclusively family slash friends in this generation. And I would say in terms of school and work, it's either a server through a work thing or an email. I think emails still have a very big part in terms of work and education. I think that's probably the primary source of communication. And then there's everything else. Like there could be random um, random things you're searching online and you could communicate through chat rooms. You could communicate through email. But I think email is still prevalent, but it's only prevalent for me specifically in terms of work or education. I won't use it to email my friends or my parents unless I'm right. like forwarding an article. So it's almost more like school, academia, professional pursuits. Now, in your training of your fellow students, uh, do you have to get them more comfortable using email? Because so many of them aren't. It has been my experience anyway. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why when I talk with my guests, we try and push how important it is. I think it's a great way to connect with anyone, like I said, and not be afraid. Because what's the worst that can happen? Somebody could say no, and right. you're not stuck there. So cold emailing is key. So that's something I like to talk about on every episode because I think that gets people more involved because they could be like, hey, I can try and email the president of the United States right now with a cold email. You can't get his phone number. You can't do anything else, but you can get the president's email. And tweet him. He'll, yeah, he'll respond. Uh, that's, that's true, too. <laughs> I think that's one of the first presidents where that's true. So that may change. But yeah. uh <laughs> What but does your generation I, think of the tweeting president that we have? Not so much about himself, but someone that holds the highest power in the land using Twitter the way he does. I think it won him the election. And I know yeah. a lot of my similar, uh, I know a lot of my peers feel the same way. Um, I think that pretty much single-handedly captivated his entire audience. And 
like I think in his mind, bad press is better than no press. Mm -hmm. So just to be able to build that people up and then people are following him because they want to see all of his awesome, crazy stuff. They want to see the stuff at 2 a.m. So they're going to follow him and that's just going to build up his own following. I mean, he has 23 million followers on Twitter prior to the election. You can't find that anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And do you think, does your generation think it's cool that he's doing it, that he's hipper, that this old guy's on Twitter, or does that even matter? Is it really more about the message and the way it's delivered? I think it's more about the message and the way it's delivered. I think probably some people look at it like it's cool. Some people probably think it's crazy. Um, but I think it's just the message that he's sending across. I think it's just another platform for him. Mm -hmm. Now, listening through some of your episodes over at 20 Under 20s, the one theme that I heard quite a bit is it seems like uh, these these very brilliant young entrepreneurs, for the most part, all suffered from ADD. Is, yeah. is that prevalent in, in, in your – well, it seems way more prevalent now than it did you know, when we were growing up. I mean, there was no such thing as ADD or ADHD. Mm -hmm. And now it seems like every young person who has any sort of interest outside of school is tagged with this ADD – you know, thing. And and I'm just curious, what what do you see in your world, in this world of young Gen Z entrepreneurs and ADD? So I'm excited you brought this up. This is something I definitely wanted to hit on. Um, as me and my fellow entrepreneurs call it, entrepreneur's disease, also known as ADD and ADHD, um, because pretty much every entrepreneur I've met around my age has ADD or ADHD. Um, and I think that in some part has related to the rise of technology because attention spans have plummeted. I mean, you're not going to, you get, if you, somebody takes away your phone, it's like somebody taking away a heroin addict's heroin. Mm -hmm. So I think that's had a huge aspect in attention span, which has probably caused ADD, ADHD, and anxiety to rise. Um, along with a lot of my uh, fellow entrepreneurs, like I said, having that and me myself, I mean, I tell stories all the time and I'd be happy to tell some stories just about anxiety, ADD on my end and how it sort of influenced me for sure. Yeah. Tell us one. So I usually go back to when I was nine years old. I don't usually hit on this, but I think it's a very important point to make. Um, when I was nine years old, I went to sleep boy camp for the first time. I had terrible panic attacks, um, anxiety, stress, all that good stuff. I guess not good stuff, but all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that sort of has stuck with me probably from nine to 16 in terms of anxiety. And that's probably shaped me in terms of my empathy, in terms of all of that um, aspect of my life has probably been caused by the anxiety that I felt from nine to 16 and panic. Um, and what from, were you anxious for not being home? Uh, what yeah. was that you figured was triggering it? So when I was at camp, it was from separation anxiety and mm -hmm. feeling of like helplessness. And now that I've realized as I got older, it was just from change. So now I know whenever I'm going into something, I'll feel that way for the first week and then it will go away. I guess I don't like change, but like when I when the summer ends and school starts back up, I feel those same feelings for a week, but it's just at a lower level than it used to be because I know how to handle it. And how has that helped you or how have you been empowered by that anxiety as a young entrepreneur? I think learning how to cope is huge. I think mm -hmm. that's had a massive impact on my life, knowing that I can control it and deal with it. Um, has had a huge, I mean, I'm not the best. I can't, I wouldn't say I can control every time. I mean, even today I sort of freaked out in school, but mm -hmm. besides that, I think coping with anxiety has definitely impacted my life because in business and in any aspect of life, I know now, I now know that like, I don't need to freak out about this. I've done way worse. Now I can do anything. If I can fly, like it went from me being a, not being able to go on a team tour three years ago where I traveled around the country with a buddy and having to get picked up in Canada because I was freaking out to now going into the city on my own on a weekly basis just to meet up with people. Mm -hmm. So just seeing that growth in myself makes me feel empowered that I know I can do it. Um, and in terms of ADD, um, I had always realized that in school, I'm, I'm, I've always been a good student. I haven't really had to study much, just naturally a pretty good student. And I just couldn't focus in class. I wasn't interested, sort of like tap my feet, always had to go to the bathroom just to walk around. Mm -hmm. And finally, I realized like two years ago, a doctor was like, you should probably go get checked out. Like you may have ADD. And I was like, okay. So I went and they said, you have ADD. And at first I looked at it as a disorder. I said, why me? That was the biggest thing. Why do I have ADD? Why am I different? And then I went to a different doctor 
And he was like, Jesse, you're so lucky to have this. If you look at any entrepreneur, that is what they have. This is a superpower. And once I made that <laughs> change in my mind, it's changed my life. I, now I know that this is how I get my ideas. This is why my brain never stops. And I know how to utilize it in the proper way. I, I commend you on that. And I think you're wise beyond your years because unfortunately, I think most young folks like you, when they hear that, it crushes them and you turned it around. And I think you make a really, really good point that attention deficit should not be a disorder or tagged as a disorder because look, at it may, even made you feel like, oh, wait, I'm different. I'm weird. Why do I have this until you were able to reframe that story for yourself? There's a gentleman out here in Phoenix in Scottsdale. His name is Otto Siegel, and he's got one of the most amazing practices called genius coaching. And I've seen him in action. He's brilliant, and he works with a lot of ADD and ADHD kids and young adults and whatever. And he makes the point that I think is relevant here is he says, you know, on this whole spectrum of intelligence, from emotional intelligence to everything else, he said on the far right, and he, he had this little, he measured like three inches on his finger, you know, from his whole uh, arm span, you know, as he's saying, and this huge uh, stratosphere, this little bit is our um, intellect, is uh, what our schools measure us on, you know, our intelligent quotient. And yet he says, we have this genius all the way to the left here that is now titled, you know, ADD and ADHD and all these other things. And he's saying, I don't care about this intelligent quotient. It doesn't matter to me. I want to look at the rest of the spectrum, you know, of, of find the unique talents and gifts and genius in people and help them leverage those instead of being uh, pushed down by society and pushed down by our educational systems and saying, oh, you must have a disorder. That means there's something wrong with you. And I just don't believe there is something wrong. I think nobody needs to be fixed. It's just like what you've done is instead of thinking that you had to fix something, you say, no, how do I amplify this? Because this is a gift. It means I don't you know, fit in with everybody else. I do it my way. So I commend you for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. But yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. Those first couple of weeks, I felt crushed. I was like, why do I have this? What's wrong with me? And it took that time. I mean, my parents were always so supportive. Um, and I think it took that transition to me understanding I could use it um, for great and be able to utilize it. And um, I think a great book that anyone should read, it's called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. And mm -hmm. it talks about how the outliers, are people with ADD, ADHD, people who may not do great in school, they end up being the most successful. Because if you're, let's say you're the valedictorian of your school, that's great. I mean, that's awesome for you, but that means that you're very good at following instructions. That means you know how to game the system and you know how to go all the way up. And a lot of them end up in top tier jobs, but they're not the ones changing the world. The people with the intuition and all of the creative and sometimes crazy ideas are the ones that make the biggest impact in the world, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. How are you leveraging this quote unquote disorder? How are you leveraging your ADD uh, in the entrepreneurial role and the mentor role you are finding yourself in? I would say in terms of using it in my group, I think it's pretty easy because everyone has it. So it's sort of just looked on <laughs> as normal. Okay. So I think that one's pretty easy to answer. And then in terms of as a mentor, I think it's just a way to say, don't look at anything as a disorder. Know how to use it. And just a diagnosis doesn't matter at all. Don't call it a disorder. Call it a superpower. I think that's the number one thing that changed my life. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, I'd like to take a break at this moment. And when we come back, Jesse, I would like for you to share with our listeners, how should brands be storying, you know, using their story market to connect with the Gen Z uh, population? And what is it that really makes you all tick? What are the, some of the mistakes brands are making in how they communicate? And uh, what can you share with us on how to really connect and grow our audiences among your, well, your fan base, basically? So let's cover that right after these messages. Hey, I'm wondering if you've been over the Business of Story website lately. 
you know what? I've totally refreshed it. Yep, a whole new chapter has begun for me here and you are at the center of the story. You see, I have one call to action on the homepage now that I think you're gonna be interested in. And that is to schedule your free 30 minute impact call. My focus is to help leaders of purpose-driven organizations like you and yours clarify your story to grow your revenue, amplify your impact, even simplify your life. And I'm so confident in our proven story cycle system that I know I can help you clarify your story in 30 minutes or less. Just go to the businessofstory.com, click on the impact call button, fill out the teeny tiny survey so I have a better understanding of you and your organization, and I'll get back with you in 48 hours to schedule your call. All you invest is 30 minutes of your time. Believe me, it's the most invaluable free advice you'll ever get. I promise you that. So hit businessofstory.com right after this show and register for your free impact call and start telling your stories on purpose. Welcome back to Business of Story and our guest today, Jesse Kay from New Jersey, a junior in high school out there, just getting ready uh, to finish up your finals, ready for the long summer, and you are doing some amazing things in entrepreneurship. So first and foremost, what do you have planned for your summer? How are you going to expand your reach and connections? So first off, I have, I think, two one-week college um, college programs, like where I'm just going to live at a college for a week, see what it's like, and see what colleges might fit for me. Um, what so schools are you looking at? I'm looking at a nice range of schools from small suburban schools to city schools. So in the Northeast, I'm looking at like Northeastern, um, Lehigh, Lafayette, Bucknell, um, Brown, Penn, a variety of schools. Uh -huh. um, but so I'm doing some times looking at that and that's going to take probably two or three weeks up of the summer um, along with that. I'm going to be focused on my podcast, using my network, um, spending time with some of the awesome people I've got to met, um, having the opportunity to meet through this. And I, I don't know, I guess besides that, go with the flow. Go with the flow. Right on. What do you think you want to study once you get to college? A hundred percent business. And if yeah. they have an entrepreneurship program, entrepreneurship. Right on. So how do we connect and talk with you folks? I think that uh, not enough brands and people are, number one, using social media, because I think if you want to connect with teens, probably 80% of their downtime is spent on social media, and you need to use social media right. Just putting up a Facebook ad probably isn't going to work. I think you have to utilize stuff like Instagram, Snapchat, all of that stuff and get involved. And to an even further extent, I think the use of influencers is huge. So let's say you take somebody with... 10 million um, subscribers on YouTube, let's just say. Um, I was just talking to Connor Blakely about this, actually. He ran a campaign for Sprint with Jake Paul, who has like 8 million views per video. And they did a whole campaign for Sprint. So you, they did some crazy thing where he like jumped on a trampoline hanging from a helicopter over an oh, ocean. Oh, yeah. Right. Yep. 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 So that he produced that entire campaign. And that's how I think you can connect because they already have all of these followers. They have your exact audience, which is our generation who are watching on a daily basis and you can spread in messages through there. So I think probably through influencers, if you look at a guy like Gary Vaynerchuk, the way he's able to use his market and connect with any age is a huge impact. I think that any brand or any person could use to target our generation. So let's go back to the channels and give us some insights. Um, if we're targeting your generation and we're on Instagram, what is the best way? What are one, two, or three tips you would give us to storytelling on Instagram? I would say video content, number one. I think that's huge. Um, I would say using- And why? Why video I, content? Because I think that's the best way you can connect. If you just listen to some audio as, like just in terms of pivoting on my podcast- I've started to now do Facebook Live or Instagram Live while I'm doing the recording so people can, number one, be interactive because I think being... So I would say, number one, video content because I think that's the best way people can hear, see, and almost feel your presence there and connect with you. So I would say Instagram Live is a huge thing you can use because number two, the number two tip I would give is being interactive with your audience. Mm -hmm. So if you can do something like an Instagram Live, you can get questions from your audience. You can get... Um, comments. You can get anything and direct and respond directly to them. 
So you can be interactive with them. They're interactive. I think that's a great way to connect and keep somebody involved. And I would say the last tip is, like I said, I would go back to influencers. If you can leverage influencers on Instagram, then you're opening up 10 million followers that you can leverage and use. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's say Facebook. What's the best way for us to communicate, connect with you all on Facebook? I think it pretty much stays the same Instagram and Facebook. I don't know if that's because Facebook owns Instagram, but yeah. I would say, once again, videos, um, Facebook Live, and influencers, or I know I sort of went against Facebook ads, but if you can do a correctly targeted Facebook ad, I think that's a great way as well. If you know exactly who you want, you can even get as far down to what pages they like. I think if you know how to correctly do a Facebook ad, Ad, I think that can have a great um, amount of influence on your campaign. And I would imagine it's not just directly targeted. That's hugely important. But then the message. Um, oh, yeah. I think. So, yeah, I think vi doing a video for a Facebook ad is the best possible thing you could do. Still. All right. So everything is video. What is it? People just don't want to read. Is it their short attention span? Because I hear this, too, in social media marketing world. It's video, video, video. Yep, I would say video, 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 and add another video. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think right? I think that the attention spans drop. Somebody's not going to be interested to reading it. Some may be, but I think the mass majority is being able to see and hear the person right there is the number one way to retain viewers and get them to interact and do whatever you're telling them to do and connect with them. And do you think that's pretty much true across segments now with anybody on social media, or is it just to Gen Zers? I think to an extent, it's to everyone. I think most specifically, if you look at millennials and Gen Z, though, but I think even adults and grandparents are getting to that point where they want to see video content and interact with it just because the entire rest of the world has gotten used to that. So I think it's sort of making its way up. Yeah. What about blogs? Is anybody reading blogs anymore? Um, not that I can think of. I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure older people do. Um, I, well, I know do, my... I'm, I mean, do you use them to go and learn more about your prospects and, and, and so forth? So it, it's almost like a research tool that enables you to drill a little bit deeper? I know some people that do. Personally, I use videos. I use Instagram pages. I use YouTube, um, anything like that. I can't remember the last time I read a blog, to be completely honest. Yeah. And I don't imagine that LinkedIn is playing much of a role in your life right now See, or in the life funny. of most of Gen Zers. It's funny. That's what everyone thinks. I think yeah. LinkedIn actually has a big impact. Um, really? And it's interesting why. Um, because if you go look at a Facebook, Instagram, or Snapchat, or Twitter, or whatever you want to look at, you're not posting anything. Prof I mean, you could be posting stuff professional, but you're also posting stuff personal. It's mm -hmm. not the right platform to try and promote your work. If you look at LinkedIn, that's the key place there. You can make those formal connections I don't. I definitely don't look at it as much as I look at a uh, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, or Twitter. But it definitely plays a part in my day. I probably look at it two or three times a day, just in terms of building connections, along with the ones I make on other social media, and being able to use as a good business um, connection. But are you the anomaly in in entrepreneurs under? Um, 20, and maybe I'll even say not even entrepreneurs, but if people are wanting to connect with Gen Zers, are they really going to be on, is your audience really going to be on LinkedIn? I would definitely say only people involved in business under yeah. 20 would be on it. There's no other reason you'd be on it. Um, right. And I would say varies depending on the person, but a lot of people that I know through what I've been doing, obviously 95% of the time they're on social media spent on the four things of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. But I would say that other Five percent. I think pretty much every person I've had on the show probably has a LinkedIn. I think it varies how much they use it, but it's definitely still an aspect in today's world in terms of a platform. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's jump over to Twitter. How are you all using Twitter and what's the best way to connect with you there? Um, you have to keep it to the point, quick. And that's another reason why I think videos or even pictures are very important on Twitter because you only have 140 characters of writing and there's only so much you can do in 140 characters. But if you can put it in a video or a picture, like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. I'd say a video is worth a million words. Mm -hmm. So if you can get a video up there, you're basically doing a thousand tweets in one tweet. And do I have to be jumping out of a helicopter onto a no. trampoline <laughs> over an ocean? Or how do we how do we cut through to, to get that attention, even in that short little microsecond? 
I would say just good content and knowing your audience. If you know what your audience is interested in, let's say you're looking for teenagers that are waiting for an inspiration to get to get started, you just pull up your camera, record a one minute video trying to inspire and say, get going right now. This is your time. Make it happen. I think as long as you know your audience and you produce good content, I think you could connect with anyone. Okay. And then finally, Snapchat. And that's a channel I don't use. I know a lot of my contemporaries use it. I haven't quite understood how to use it in business. So you need to coach me, Jesse. What can I do on Snapchat to grow business of story? So this is interesting because there's a pretty big debate going on right now whether Snapchat's going down because Instagram has created Instagram stories. Mm -hmm. And Instagram stories are pretty much the exact same thing as Snapchat. And because there's, you can't really put a patent or whatever on Snapchat. They're, it's just sending pictures and them going away. So Instagram is building it into their platform, which many people who like Snapchat fear could eliminate Snapchat because why would you leave Instagram's platform to go on Snapchat when they already have it? And I've seen the amount of movement Instagram has already um, has 40 million more active users on Instagram every day than on Snapchat. Oh, really? Yeah. So you're so, seeing that progression. Yeah, I've heard both sides of the argument, but it's pretty much looking like right now Instagram stories are taking over. However, mm -hmm. if you still want to promote on Snapchat, I think there's great ways to do it. Geo filters is the number one thing I would say. And, and what's a, a geo filter? So a geo filter is if you take a picture on Snapchat, you can do tons of filters. You can make your face look like a dog. You can do whatever <laughs> you want. If you keep swiping, you'll find something that may say your town and it's a graphic or it could be. Um, it will say sponsored like McDonald's half price burgers or whatever. And mm -hmm. so if you can know how to utilize it, it's all based off of location and you pay per square foot, I think, and the time. So let's say you want to do a deal right near your place or you want to, let's say you have a book coming out. You can say um, you could target a certain demographic and when they're going through their stories, they could either have an ad pop up, like slide on to them and you can swipe up to read more info on it. Or you can use geo filters where people can just swipe it onto their picture where it looks interesting and it will say sponsored by McDonald's, for example. And that will just drive campaign awareness and branding. I got you. And do you think um, Instagram stories will ultimately take over from Snapchat? Yeah, I don't know how quick it will be, but um, my prediction is within five years, um, Instagram will heavily control that market. I think it could be sooner, but I always like to give myself that two-year um, margin of error. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Smart young man. All right. So how do you market your podcast, 20 Under 20s? I market it probably two key ways. Number one, through social media. So whenever I release a new episode, release new content, push it out. And like I said, I started doing Facebook Lives, which have been very helpful um, because people have been able to interact and see the content as it's going live and ask questions themselves. So that would be just like you and I right now. I did a Facebook Live earlier today with a client of ours took, you know, who went through our branding program and just to share with the viewers what that was all about. But what you're talking about is I could literally have uh, Facebook Live on right now yep. and, and just shooting me interviewing you even though they're not seeing you. They can, you can do it where you see me. Um, right. There's a great new website. It's called belive.tv. Yep, I've been using that as well. So when you're doing yours, um, that's, that's what you're doing. Yep, so that I have the videos. You can put different messages on the screen. So I think that's another great way to market. I saw someone post something how webinars are now going to be controlled by Facebook Live. And they've had the craziest interactions they've ever seen. Because number one, you can share. So you can mm -hmm. get people to share it. And then it's with their entire network. And like I said, you can interact. People can ask questions. They can like it. They can do whatever they want on it. And that way I'm getting two for one. I'm getting the audio that I'm saving and turning into the audio podcast and the yep. Facebook Live. Yeah, very, very, very smart. Now, um, you didn't do that with your first 10, but you've been doing them with some of your subsequent podcasts? Yeah, my latest episode with um, one of my last ones with Caleb Maddox, um, that was it's now on iTunes. It's episode 10, but it was yeah. also on my Facebook live. That is on my Facebook live as well. Um, that was shot live. And do you offer any different content on your podcast versus what you're doing with Facebook live? Or is it just basically the same thing? You're just getting the audio from it. Yep. Pretty much just getting the audio from it. And I'm getting more viewers because I'm getting probably 3000 people that will eventually see it over a week on Facebook. Plus the certain amount of people I'll get to download the podcast online. So I think it's just a better way to spread the word. 
A lot of fun. Now, have you become a sensation in your high school? I mean, your fellow students have been listening to your podcast and you've been helping them grow their businesses. I find this question funny. Um, At first, they were like, Jesse, what are you doing? Why are you emailing Mark Cuban? We're going back to the beginning. They're like, you're crazy. And then I got and then I got a response from Mark Cuban and they're like, oh, my God. (laughs) <laughs> so, um, yes, people know about the podcast. The school's been very supportive. They've promoted it for me. They've done great things. But I think, yes, people have been following the podcast, but I think even more, they've been more interested in the network I've been able to create for my, the podcast. So, I don't know. Guys, this past weekend, um, just as a story, because people uh, love to, they were talking about it all week with me. Um, I went to a house um, and I played um, basketball. I can't play basketball, by the way, but I attempted <laughs> to play basketball with Connor Blakely, my buddy, and pro NFL players, NBA players, and other people. And then I went and met Derek Jeter. That's not a typical day in the life, um, I would say. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I don't say that as any way of an ego or bragging. I just say that as if I could do this in six months, anyone could do anything in six months. And this all came out of your need or you're hearing your fellow students saying, seeing that they had these great ideas, but not knowing what to do with it. So you said, I've got an idea. Let me just start assembling people, having a podcast, and then sharing this insight with your students, friends, so that they can start their businesses. Yup. And that network has taken me way further than I ever would have expected in six to eight months. That is awesome. All right. So let's close. If you could share with us a couple final tips, techniques that we need to do as story marketers to be able to reach out, A, maybe number one, to connect with your audiences, but number two, just as business people in general, what are you hearing from your guests that we can all learn from about being better, more ambitious, more successful business owners? I would say, number one, you want to be consistent. So if you're, whether it's you're releasing a podcast, you're doing videos, you want to stay consistent and you want to have good content because you want everyone to know, this is what I have to do. Monday night, I want to listen to this. Tuesday, I want to listen to this. I think that's the number one thing. I would say number two, test things out. There's no loss. I mean, if you could just test it out with your friends, test it out with a couple of your audience just through social media, ask opinions. I think that's a great way for any business owner to be able to see what a new product would be. And number three, I would say go back and leverage social media, leverage video content as much as you can. I am trying to push that message out as exaggerated as I can because I think it's such a huge impact. I think video is going to change the way social media is and try and either get on Facebook Live and Instagram Live as often as you can just to interact with your audience, hear their thoughts and build your brand. Awesome. And what do you got planned for the weekend? This weekend, I think I will be catching up on some sleep, um, recording some interviews, and probably catching up on some more sleep. (laughs) And where can people learn more about you and hear your podcast? So you can go on www.20under20s.com. Um, I'm sure you'll have that link. but that- And that's 20under20s.com, just to be clear. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, mm-hmm. You can find all the info on the guests I've had. There's links to it on iTunes. You can find all of the info on the show there. You can check me out on Instagram at jesse.kay11. Um, look me up on Facebook, Jesse K., And if anyone has any questions or comments or they just want to bring something up with me, feel free to email me at J-E-S-S-E-K-A-Y-811 at gmail.com, jessek811 at gmail.com. All right, Jesse, thank you so much for being here on Business of Story. It's been a real pleasure talking with you this Friday. It's been great. Thanks for having me. All right. And thank you all for listening to this edition of Business of Story. Of course, if you like what you're hearing, visit me over at iTunes share your thoughts, share the show uh, so the rest of your world can hear some of these great guests like Jesse that we bring on every single week. And if I can be of assistance to you, join me over at businessofstory.com where I've got tips, tools, techniques, and trainings to help you craft and tell compelling brand stories that sell. And now you know how to sell to Gen Z. Thanks so much for Jesse. And until next Monday, when we will have another amazing story artist on, have a wonderful life.